Now there are many more things to say about lists and loops, but now seems an appropriate place to stop and summarize what we've covered so far. And we've seen that lists provide a convenient way to collect objects. Lists are themselves objects. They are a container in which we can put various elements or objects. And a list literal is created by writing square brackets with the elements of the list separated by commas. So here's an example where we assign to the identifier x list the list literal that has three elements. The first element is the integer 1, the second is the string 2, and the third element is the float that is obtained from the expression 6 divided by 2. Lists are objects. They have several methods associated with them. We considered four of them, append, extend, sort, and count. And to access any of these methods, to use them, we use the dot notation that we've described before. We give the list identifier object name dot then the method and whatever arguments the method takes. So here's an example where we are just appending the integer 4 to the list x list. We've seen that we could cycle through the values of a list or any iterable using a for loop and the syntax is we write the keyword for then provide a loop variable the keyword in and then the iterable. Here we have for item in x list where we're assuming x list is some list and then the body of this loop is indented code. Here we just say to print item, print the loop variable. So this will go through all the elements of x list and print them one by one. We also talked about accumulators and they're used to build a value where we're building within the loop. The accumulator changes for each iteration of the loop. And here's an example where we are using the identifier sum as an accumulator. We initialize that to zero outside of the loop. And here we are assuming y list is a collection of numeric values. And we are just saying for item in y list, add that item to the current sum and reassign that back to sum. Reassign that back to the accumulator. Now we mentioned that we can use indexing to access a given element of a list. The index is given in brackets following the list. The index is an integer or some expression that returns an integer and the first element has an index of zero. So think of that index as the offset from the beginning of the list. And in this example here, we're just saying print x list with an index of 1. So that would be the second element of x list. We talked about the range function, and it generates a sequence of integers. And we can specify a start value and an increment, but we must specify a stop value. So we've seen that the range function can be given with one, two, or three arguments. When the increment isn't given, it's assumed to be one. When the start value isn't given, it's assumed to be zero. But that stop value must be given, and the sequence of integers never reaches that stop value. And the form of the sequence is shown at the bottom here, where we have the first integer value is the start value. The next one is start plus the increment, then start plus two times the increment, and so on, going up to, but not including the stop value. The range function is often used as the iterable in the header of a for loop. And by doing that, we could obtain a simple counted loop where we want to execute the body a given number of times then we just would specify that number as the sole argument of the range function. Or we can use range to produce the indices for some list as demonstrated here. So we could have for i in range the length of x list and then we could print x list using explicit indexing. We've seen that lists and tuples behave the same way in many situations, but lists are mutable and tuples are immutable, meaning that we can change the value of list. We could change individual elements, we could extend or append to a list, but tuples are immutable. We can't change their elements, we cannot change their length. 
We also considered how a programming construct with a header and a body can be embedded in another programming construct that has a header and a body. What we considered was where we wanted to put within the body of a function a for loop. So both for loops and functions have headers and bodies. And what we saw is we just have to pay attention to the indentation. The body of the nested or embedded programming construct is indented one more level than the construct in which it's nested or embedded. Now, as I mentioned before, there's plenty more to consider in terms of lists and loops, and we'll get to those in the next set of videos.